And it's wonderful to be back here, actually. It, it's really a delight. Um, normally, I'm on that side of the, the podium, and uh, I'm, I'm used to it, so <clears throat> you'll have to pardon me if i got to get used to being on this side of the podium. And it, it, what I'm going to do is a little odd, particularly given what David has been describing, um, which is accurate, um, but uh, the, the things I'm really most working on right now are two things. One, of all things, is a memoir about the 60s, about um, the 1960s, focused on the 1960s. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that at all. Um, and the other is continuing to deal with um, the question of the Heath Anthology and how it changes and how it doesn't change, and uh, the questions raised by changes in the, the publishing industry, <clears throat> which are quite horrifying and fascinating at the same time. I'm not going to talk about that either. What I am going to talk about, if I can see here, um, what I'm going to talk about, here we go, light. Um, I want to talk about our work, uh, our work lives. Something we'd often like to forget, or if you're a student, something you might not want to think about, at least not quite yet, thank you. Um, I want to talk, I want to ask a couple of questions. For whom do we work? Ourselves alone? Um, our families, our communities, our groups or collectives, or as Jack Kennedy once uh, posed it, um, asks what you can do for your country by way of work. My other primary question has to do with this. Do we work solely to produce things, books, paintings, bread, and so forth, that people need and want? Um, I want to address such questions um, as they have been explored by some of the notable writers, uh, mainly in the 19th century and before, in the United States. And they're fairly traditional writers, unlike my usual work, which has to do with uh, more untraditional writers. Let me start out by imagining a man that I will call Robert Jones. He lives in a small, tight cottage on the edge of Tiverton in what is now Rhode Island, uh, 1765. Part of the cottage constitutes a workshop in which Robert Jones makes boots for friends and neighbors in Tiverton and Fall River. He will create the boots from materials he has on hand um, or others that he might be able to obtain once you and he have agreed uh, on a price and a date by which he will deliver his product. The date must be somewhat flexible because if the blues begin to run, uh, he will take time off from his last to devote to fishing and to smoking his catch, blue fish being, as you, many of you know, particularly appealing and practical to eat when smoked. He might even be willing to send you some. Um, and other obligations like planting and weeding and harvesting squash and corn on his, the sm small plot adjacent to his cottage might also interfere with his making boots from time to time. But he would call himself uh, a shoemaker or a bootmaker and a citizen of Rhode Island or at least of New England. Now, Robert Jones is a fiction, not in the sense that he could not have existed like Orpheus in the underworld, for example, um, because there were undoubtedly many people like Robert Jones in the colonial world of North America. But a fiction in the sense that this image of the independent American artisan, entrepreneur, and farmer has constituted and continues to constitute the expression of a powerful, if not altogether distinctive, American ideology. He is the yeoman farmer um, whose presumed independence and virtue have uh, overdetermined the shape of politics and somewhat decreasingly society in the United States. 
What the image of Robert Jones illustrates is an idealized solution to a set of difficult questions having to do with work and class. Why do we work? When, for whom, under what circumstances, among other questions. I introduce this image of Robert Jones to help us approach an ongoing argument over work and class that emerges regularly in, the, uh, in certain of the literary texts that have been created in what is now the United States. Of course, one of the first things the image of the yeoman farmer makes disappear, in effect, is Robert Jones' partner, Anne. It is, in fact, likely she who in the main planted, weeded, and harvested the squash and corn of their garden. And she may well have had more than a small hand in stitching up the boots he has sold. But what I need mainly to point to is their differing relationship to the family, to the family unit they and their children constituted. For that unit would have been designated as the family of one Robert Jones. And as I shall propose in a moment, from the very beginning of the European, uh, <clears throat> of European American social structures, that designation shapes how women, as well as men, relate to the issues I introduced a moment ago. Why do we work? When? For whom? Under what circumstances? For almost all women, the answers to such questions emerge from the definition of the family of one Robert Jones what that implies about why, when, and for whom, and how that determined independence, virtue, and politics in these United States. Among the classic expressions of this debate about work and class, at least one side of it, is one of the first works of British America, William Bradford's Off Plymouth Plantation. Bradford inaugurates a central uh, premise about work in America. It has in part to do with what Bradford took to be a particular organization of work as necessary for survival. He states that form of organization in a section of a Plymouth plantation called the end of the common course and condition. Those of you who have read Bradford will be familiar with with this, but I have a little bit of it on one of the sheets, uh, the sheet that you have. A decision is made by Bradford and other leaders of the colony that they should set corn every man for his own particular. And in that regard, trust to themselves. This had very good success, Bradford continues, for it made all hands very industrious and it produced more corn than the existing collective farming approach had done. But productivity is only one of the goals of the change thus inaugurated. Another seems to have been controlling the discontent of men, especially the young and strong. And this is the first of these uh, quotations. For the young men that were most able and fit for labor and service did repine that they should spend their time and strength to work for other men's wives and children without any recompense. The strong or men of parts had no more in division of victuals and clothes than he that was weak and not able to do a quarter the other could. This was thought injustice. And for men's wives to be commanded to do service for other men as dressing their meats, washing their clothes, etc., they deemed it a kind of slavery Neither could many husbands well brook it. Upon the point all being to have alike and all to do alike, they thought themselves in the like condition, and one as good as another. And so if it did not cut off those relations that God hath set amongst men, yet it did at least much diminish and take off the mutual respects that should be preserved amongst them, and would have been worse if they had been men of another condition. The passage critiques collectivism and thereby asserts an individualist work ethic that has become American common sense. To re-examine it, I want to evoke an alternative conception from Raymond Williams' Culture and Society, a wonderful book that I want to recommend uh, to you. Um, 
Williams distinguishes the ideas of what he calls bourgeois individualism with the idea um, that, uh, and those are the working class, and I'm quoting him here, the individualist idea can be sharply contrasted with the idea that we properly associate with the working class. An idea which, whether it's called communism, socialism, or cooperation, regards society neither as neutral nor as protective, but as the positive means for all kinds of development, including individual development. Development and advantage are not individually, but commonly interpreted. The provision of the means of life will, alike in production and distribution, be collective and mutual. Williams' idea may be a bit formulaic in its binary construction, individualism versus collectivity um, uh, that, of that sort, but it helps us understand how right from the beginning of English settlement, an individualist capitalist culture that fundamentally rejects forms of collectivity would become the dominant mode of American economic and social philosophy. Self-interest here provides the only antidote, as far as Bradford is concerned, to human corruption. Working for oneself made all hands very industrious and productive, whereas working for the general good had led to excuses and sloughing off. Community, from Bradford's perspective, retarded the work, employment, necessary to the benefit and comfort of the individuals in the society, including the benefit and comfort conveyed by rank and gender. The common course and condition he had, he argues, led to tensions precisely over rank and gender. The aged and graver men, graver men resented uh, resented the implication that equality in expectations of work and of vittles diminished their status, all being to have alike and all to do alike. They thought themselves in the like condition and one as good as another. God forbid! Rank here is emphatically detached from work and conditioned on age and gravity, whatever that might be. Perhaps that had to do, as it often does with politicians, with interpretive skill. Similarly, stronger men questioned the corollary from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. For them, the second part of that equation needed to read from each according to his ability to each according to his work. What is most striking, perhaps, in, is Bradford's presentation of the gender implications of the change in the structure of work. Under the community organizational model, Bradford argues, women sought excuses, like childcare obligations, to avoid doing the work of the farm. And now women went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set corn. They no longer felt the resentment equivalent in some sense to slavery of doing the laundry and cooking for men outside their families. That is, they saw themselves as free, self-determining people rather than as servants. Most of all, perhaps, the men no longer felt jealous exasperation, I suppose, at having their wives, their wives, doing other men's household chores. The gender division of labor is, of course, hardly surprising, nor is the hierarchy of work in which male-identified labor in the field is clearly more important than the female-defined tasks of the household and child care. But Bradford's suggestion about the psychology of masculine possessiveness remains striking. Neither could many husbands well brook it. That is to say, not only is the society formed around a gendered hierarchy of labor, but the operative force sustaining that hierarchy and others, Bradford mentions, are specifically male passions, and that, as he says, amongst godly and sober men. Now, the connection between a religion dedicated to individual salvation and an economic structure dedicated to individual advancement 
has of course constituted a central feature of later social analyses by people like Weber and Tawney. And I, I don't need to repeat anything of that here. What I want to emphasize is first the centrality of work and property to the establishment of the new world capitalist structure in which we continue to live. And second, the question, for whom are you working? The emphatic answer provided by Bradford and almost 400 years worth of American men after him is myself. That's who I'm working for. We saw some illustration of that last night. <laughs> we might further speculate that for Bradford, work thus defined was what identified the British colonists as civilized, in contrast to the pagan Indians, whom they saw as simply living off the land rather than working it by the sweat of their brow as the Bible commanded. As Annette Culloden had put it, European colonists clung to the virtue of labor, equating toil with civilization, and scorned the Indians as uncivilized for what the whites interpreted as their willful idleness. As capitalism developed and managed to gain control over important work technologies, a new paradigm of work emerged. Individual workers, even the Jeffersonian yeoman, were unable to compete in the cost-effective production of goods. And since they had very little real, real access to land, they were increasingly forced to sell their labor for a wage rather than their product for a price. Wage labor seems to us, of course, perfectly, na perfectly natural, well, normal. But early in the 19th century, it was a very controversial idea. Here is Orestes Brownson, the second of these. Um, in regard to labor, two systems obtain. One, that of slave labor. The other, that of free labor. I should say Brownson was an active abolitionist. Of the two, the first is, in our judgment, except so far as the feelings are concerned, decidedly the least oppressive. If the slave has never been a free man, we think, as a general rule, his sufferings are less than those of the free laborer at wages. As to the actual freedom, one has just about as much as the other. The laborer at wages has all the disadvantages of freedom and none of its blessings, while the slave, if denied the blessings, is freed from the disadvantages. We are no advocates of slavery, <laughs> but we say frankly, that if there must always be a laboring population distinct from proprietors and employers, we regard the slave system as decidedly preferable to the system of wages. That's Brownson. His analysis of the deplorable state of wage labor poses an inescapable question. What is to be done? Brownson answers, Christianity. The answer of Bartleby, the scrivener, is contained in what amounts to the refrain of Melville's story by that name. I prefer not to. Melville's story, like his other fictions of working class life, offers no solutions. That is, of course, one of its points. Within the framework defined by the story's unnamed lawyer, there are no available alternatives to wage labor, not even well-intended Christian charity. The lawyer, who's the narrator, those of you know Bartleby, um, many of you do, uh, the lawyer who's the narrator of the, of the story is himself a significant functionary in the economic world which the subtitle of the story, a story of Wall Street, names. Here's what he says, I am one of those unambitious lawyers who in the cool tranquility of a snug retreat do a snug business among rich men's bonds and mortgages and title deeds. It is this world into which Bartleby is hired as a scrivener or copyist. 
Bartleby, unlike the lawyer's other employees, is for a time a perfect worker, almost. At first, Bartleby did, this is the lawyer, at first Bartleby did an extraordinary quantity of writing. I should have been quite delighted with his application had he been cheerfully industrious. But he wrote on, silently, palely, mechanically. Bartleby does his job ever so well. He is unlike the other workers, neither choleric nor tanked up. And <laughs> but his attitude, his attitude, Bartleby's attitude, marks him as somehow alien to the existing scheme of things and a source, therefore, of tension which conflicts with the lawyer's profound con conviction that the easiest way of life is the best. What the lawyer wants, indeed what the system tries to compel, is for the worker not only to do the job, but to internalize its requirements, be thoroughly invested in its rationality, the logic of wage labor. That is the function of ideology. It is shortly after the lawyer's observation of something resistant in Bartleby that the latter, Bartleby, first proclaims that he would prefer not to participate in one of the defining tasks of the office, proofing copy. Perhaps it is at this point that Bartleby recognizes what the anarchist writer Bob Black, well, quite later, describes as the dynamic of domination intrinsic to work. The remainder of the story leads us through a series of retreats by Bartleby from the world of wage labor. He declines, I prefer not to, he declines to participate in the general work of the office, ultimately in work at all. He declines to leave the office, which has become his abode. He declines to leave the building when he's evicted from the office. And when he is cast out of the building and taken to the tombs, New York's prison, he declines to eat and thus passes into history. At each stage of his withdrawal, the baffled lawyer proposes alternatives, all of which can be accommodated within the labor system. Bartleby might be excused from writing as a form of workman's compensation, since perhaps the lawyer thinks his eyes have become, come to trouble him. He might be convinced by some combination of financial inducement and disapproval to quit the lawyer or on his own. He might consider alternative forms of wage labor, a dry goods clerk a bartender, a bill collector, a personal companion. Ultimately, pursues the exasperated lawyer, he might go home with me now, not to my office, but my dwelling. To all, Bartleby would prefer not to make any change at all. For even such charity changes nothing in the dominative structure of work or even of char charity. What is the logic of Bartleby's position? We are, of course, never within his head. And apart from stating his preference not to do things, we hear very little directly from him. So his motives, central to the story, remain obscure. The story itself, with its numerous evocations of the Bible and its suggestive portrait of the lawyer's thought processes, offers no simple answer. Yet. It is not a Rorschach inkblot test into which we project our own imaginings. Bartleby is clearly a story about work under capitalism, about a kind of strike, a work stoppage after all. But the object of the strike, as the lawyer only slowly comes to see, is not, as usual with strikes, better working conditions, a higher wage, shorter hours, or the like. Bartleby makes none of the usual demands. He simply prefers not to. Not to what? I want to suggest that the object of his increasing resistance is the wage labor system itself. How does one contest the system? Bartleby's method, the strike, the withdrawal of his labor, can only go so far. A strike usually implies that if the conditions improve, work will resume. 
But contesting the fundamental demand of work, that you do it and get paid, is another matter. That implies withdrawal of self, a turning away from the office, the factory, the courts, to a wall. That is all the law office really offers, as we see from the lawyer's initial description of the views from his windows. But Bartleby, in the end, has nothing to choose but the walls or the tombs within which he perishes. Bartleby's actions are predicated <clears throat> on the very individualism that lies at the heart of his problem. Nothing else seems available, especially to the lone worker. Bradford's claim, so well systematized by people like Franklin, and elevated to sovereignty in the form of the Jeffersonian yeoman farmer, our friend Robert Jones, hinges on individual action directed ultimately at accumulating wealth. But individualism is a one-way street. The force of the wage-labor system so well represented in the story by the rush of people and vehicles in the streets of New York sweeps everything with it. You cannot divert it, much less hold it back. As Hemingway's hero Harry Morgan says some 80 years later, no matter how a man alone ain't got no bloody chance. Indeed, so strong was and is this ideology that even the most explicitly socialist of well-known American writers, Jack London, could hardly get beyond it. London's fascinating story, The Apostate, which I suspect most of you have not read, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a wonderful story, but I'll say something about it. Um, it records the pro a process of discovery much like, I imagine, Bartleby's. He uncovers the overwhelming mercilessness of the wage labor system. Like Bartleby, London's Johnny was the perfect worker. He had been born, literally, in the mill, worked there much of his life, and accepted its fundamental nature. It seemed to him as useless to oppose the overseer as to defy the will of a machine. Being held up as the example of the perfect worker meant nothing to him. He had been told so often. It was a commonplace. From the perfect worker, he had evolved into the perfect machine. But even perfect machines break down. One day in the spring of his 18th year, Johnny comes down with a bad case of la grippe and is confined to bed for a week and to recovery at the doorstep of their house for another. Suddenly he has the time to figure. I've been doing a lot of figuring this week, this week and it's most surprising. What he discovers in his figuring is the source of his total weariness. What makes me tired moves. I've been moving ever since I was born. He calculates that on an earlier job in a glass factory, he had done something like a million moves a month, 12 million moves a year. At the looms, I've been moving twice as much. By contrast, this week, I ain't moved nothing at all. I ain't made one move in hours and hours. I tell you, it was swell just sitting there, hours and hours and doing nothing. I ain't never been happy before. <laughs> So he has decided not to move anymore to the forced rhythms of the mill. And he tells his mother, I ain't never going to work again. <laughs> My God, Johnny, she wailed. Don't say that. What he had said was blasphemy to her. As a mother who hears her child deny God, was Johnny's mother shocked by his words. So powerful is God's job, as Tilly Olson calls it in Yonandia, that Johnny can gain a modicum of happiness, even to the astonishment of his mother, occasionally laugh, only by removing himself from the terrain of work. He walks away, and the story ends as he awkwardly climbs into an empty box car. He closed the door. The engine whistled. Johnny was lying down, and in the darkness, he smiled. The ending of the apostate that I've just read seems more affirmative than that of Bartleby. The end of Bartleby, uh, he smiled, he smiled, rings differently from, ah, Bartleby, 
Ah, oh, humanity. Or Melville's previous sentence, on errands of life, these letters speed to death. And of course, Bartleby now lies with kings and counselors. Whereas Johnny is heading somewhere out of the factory, perhaps into life, or at least wherever the train will take him. Both a court within the individualist paradigm so central to American ideology since 1623, neither so much as hints at an alternative way of contesting wage labor apart from individual withdrawal from it. Obviously, London was aware of alternatives. During the first decade of the 20th century, he was deeply involved in socialist politics, actively promoted the intercollegiate socialist society. It's a wonderful name for an organization. <laughs> Start one. Inter intercollegiate <laughs> socialist society. Prepared a fundraising call to ensure publication of Upton Sinclair's quintessentially socialist novel, The Jungle, and himself wrote an important fiction, The Iron Heel, 1908, the first half of which is largely a series of lectures on scientific socialism by the, uh, the book's hero, Ernest Everhard. Get away with names. He wrote The Strength of the Strong, 1911, a parable about the necessity for people to organize in order to defeat capitalism. He also wrote The Dream of Debs, 1909, about the success of a general strike in San Francisco. But those are hardly optimistic texts. The last, uh, Dream of Debs, uh, as its title says, is a dream. The narrator of the strength of the strong with his three grandsons is the sole survivor of his tribe. And the fascism of the Iron Heel is overthrown only after many centuries of repression have passed. London's fiction is not, of course, simply ideology dressed in story form. So there, are, there is no reason to think that he wished to uh, embody some collective alternative to individual action in narrative, but couldn't, couldn't figure out how. Again and again, the protagonists of London's stories of resistance and revolution, and I'm, I just will mention a couple of them worth um, while to look at. The Mexican, 1911, or one of the best that I love, Kulau the Leper, 1909, about the, the spread and the resistance of uh, a Hawaiian man to uh, the way in, in which a uh, uh, physical disability is treated. They're powerful individuals, the heroes of these stories, like more, most of his revolutionary heroes. While the delightful South of the Slot, 1909, extols working class life, we actually see very little of it except for the riotous scene in which the strikers against the meat trust and the story's central figure, Bill Tots, rain chunks of coal from a wagon down upon policemen trying to break up their blockade of the strike breakers. It's one of the uh, great scenes in uh, American literature. Whatever his beliefs about socialist alternatives to capitalist domination, London's fiction was fundamentally shaped by individualist ideology. His political fiction, like the apostate, have largely to do with failed or at best ambiguous efforts to challenge, forget, transcend the assumptions underwriting the norms of wage labor. Nor should this be surprising. London modeled himself as an entrepreneurial writer who succeeded in cultivating the terrain of class conflict. In addition, it is not clear that any author has an alternative to individual success or failure, an issue that would become something of an obsession for leftist writers of the 1930s. The irony here is that, London, is that London's era, the turn of the 20th century, was the moment in American history in which socialist and other alternatives to capitalism may have reached their greatest strength. In the presidential election of 1912, Socialist Party candidate Eugene Victor Debs received over 900,000 votes, almost 6% of the total. 
the largest socialist vote apart from 1920. Socialists had elected over a thousand local officials in most parts of the country, outside the South, of course. Trusts were under attack and reformist legislation like that stimulated by the jungle passed Congress and became law. The uh, Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, with its revolutionary slogan, the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. They were founded in 1905 along with the Intercollegiate Socialist Society, of which London was in fact elected president. And while the American Federation of Labor, um, which did not support socialism, believe me, encountered serious setbacks in the decade after the turn of the century. Its form of trade unionism had at least been established as a reality of the American industrial landscape. Such developments may have led left-wing socialists like London to feel that the revolution was nearing and that in the foreseeable future millions would sign their letters, yours for the revolution. Socialism would take control of the Congress and capitalist exploitation would be brought to an end. London's novel, The Iron Heel, which examines the political questions boiling during the first decade of the 20th century, can be read in two ways. One is as a dystopian depiction of the coming of fascism. The other is as a kind of warning that unless socialists and other reformers adopted the intellectual and organizational strategies that its hero, Ernest Everhart, advocates, the whole progressive project would suffer a crushing defeat. In any case, arguably never before had questions of labor in American society been so vigorously debated. In this intellectual tumult, ideas about changing the fundamental character of work played a role. These range from Paul LaForgue's The Right to Be Lazy, 1883, <laughs> a wonderful book, um, to the forms of utopianism portrayed by Edward Bellamy in Looking Backward, 1888, and the many responses thereto, there were lots of them, as well as a more, more implicitly in Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Her Land, 1915. In fact, the complaint of Jack London's hero, Ernest Everhard, against the capitalist oligarchy in the Iron Heel has less to do with the fundamental ideology underwriting wage slavery than with the idea that the oligarchy has mismanaged, mismanaged labor and cheated workers and thereby curtailed the enormous product productivity of modern machines, which could otherwise supply the wants of all people. Everhard's idea, therefore, was not to destroy the machines, but to take them over on behalf of the working class. The centrality and value of individual labor did not come into question. All the same. Some more recent writing about the meaning and value of work itself may bring us back to the configurations of labor formed, as I have argued at the outset, in British colonization of the New World. For example, here is philosopher Bertrand Russell on the subject at the height of the Depression, 1932. I want to say in all seriousness that a great deal of harm is being done in the modern world by the belief in the virtuousness of work and that the road to happiness and prosperity lies in an organized diminution of work. The morality of work is the morality of slaves and the modern world has no need of slavery. And from the more contemporary domain of imaginative anarchism is Bob Black. No one should ever work. <laughs> work is the source of nearly all the misery in the world. Almost any evil you'd care to name comes from working or from living in a world designed for work. In order to stop suffering, we have to stop working. That doesn't mean we have to stop doing things. It does mean creating a new way of life based on play. In other words, a ludic revolution. By play, I mean also festivity, creativity, conviviality, commensality, and maybe, maybe even art. There is more to play than child's play, as worthy as that is. 
I call for a collective adventure in generalized joy and freely independent exuberance. <laughs> right. <laughs> Bob Black is always fun to read, which you can do online. Or less an expression of philosophy or anarchism and more in the vein of contemporary social science, here's Kathy Weeks, um, whose book has been um, considerably uh, the problem with work, feminism, Marxism, anti-work politics, and post-war imaginaries. It's been considerably uh, influential in recent years. Here's what she says in her own particular form. The glorification of work is a prototypically, as a prototypically human endeavor, as the key both to social belonging and individual achievement constitutes the fundamental ideological foundation of contemporary capitalism. It was built on the basis of this ethic. It, capitalism, was built on the basis of this ethic, which continues to serve the system's interests and rationalize its outcomes. Where attitudes are productive, the refusal of work, understood as a rejection of work as a necessary center of social existence, moral duty, ontological essence, and time and energy, and understood as a practice of insubordination to the work ethic, can speak forcefully and incisively to our present situation. In our own time, the word artisan has gained a new resonance and respectability. As if to pose what I have here represented by Robert Jones against the triumph of mass production and culture. Jones is the prototypical artisan. Are we to take artisan bread and artisan cheese as straws blowing in a wind of cultural change? Maybe, along with pleasing our appetites, they offer hard questions emerging from the shadows in which Ann Jones has resided low these many years. Or are they merely reflection of the enormous privilege that large numbers of Americans, even in the face of downward mobility, racism, and huge income disparities, that enormous numbers of Americans do share. Do we see the, what's now called the gig economy, as it has come to be called as, uh, as an Uber, for example, as yet one more tricky way of exploiting workers, or as a mechanism by which people can detach themselves from the discipline of wage labor? However one might answer such questions or otherwise interrogate the values of contemporary capitalism, it is certainly true that the issues raised by rereading Bradford and Bartleby, Ben Franklin or Fanny Fern or Jack London have come into our intellectual horizon. And there I will stop. Go ahead. Um, thanks very much, Paul. Um, I've learned a lot from your talk, and I, I really take, um, I think if I had to sum up your contribution here, I feel like it's a real re-emphasis of Marx's great distinction between labor and work. And I really liked kind of tracking your move from talking about work to talking about labor as we went along yeah. through the paper. I especially appreciated the way that you did this through um, putting Bartleby and Johnny the Apostate together. And I was wondering if you would mind like, revisiting that pairing. <coughs> I found that pairing to be really powerful and, um, and really helpful in thinking about these ideas of work and idleness and resistance. And so here's my question. My question is, why do you think that Johnny the Apostate doesn't recognize his figuring. His, as his work, what? His figuring as work. 
Um, I really like how you put these two idle figures together. Um, but clearly, you know, even though Johnny the Apostate is sick, he's still very productive, right? He's doing all this figuring. He's mm -hmm. doing all this thinking. He's creating this perspective. He's creating a chance to resist the system that he's never looked outside of up until now. He's creating all this critique. So he's really productive while yes. he's idle, but he's not working. And so, um, why do you think that? Why do you think that that's not that that doesn't um, get registered in London's text? That's an interesting question. Um, I think in part it has to do with London's conception uh, of work and uh, of labor. Um, and it's a funny, a funny way he has. He never exactly talks about writing and, and thinking as work, as labor. And yet he does that all the time. That is his form of work. Um, and in a way, uh, he is, uh, as he often does, um, posing Johnny's thinking as something different from Johnny as a laborer. And that's one of the problems, I think, uh, one of the ideological problems that one has, among other things, with, with London's work, <coughs> that is, with, with, uh, with London's texts. Um, I think that's, that is a, a, a real problem. He doesn't think about it that way, or at least he doesn't present his thoughts about it in, in those terms. Although I think that that's a very productive way of approaching him, and one that, that would be useful to pursue, um, to, to think about how he separates out the, the manual physical labor and what that means. So, I, you know, I'm not jumping on that conversation, but the book where he does that is Martin Eden, right? The semi autobiographical novel where he talks about brain work. But, yeah. Paul, I, I have a question about. That's right. It, um, so, there's a question that haunts me in American literature, and it's in the beginning of Grapes of Wrath where a farmer comes back and he is watching a bulldozer come to wipe off his farm. And he asks the guy who's driving, who's working? Uh, who can I shoot? Because he's going to shoot the driver. And the driver says, no, don't, don't shoot me. Go shoot the bank manager. He says, well, if I go to the bank manager and I shoot him, what's he going to say? He's going to say, you know, go shoot somebody at the state capitol. And it just keeps going on and on. Yeah. So I'm going to pose a radical question to you. Who do we shoot? <laughs> like if, we're gonna, you know, but if I'm going to take the paradigm of I would prefer not to, seriously, like, who do I uh, metaphorically shoot in the conditions of that? Well, look, that's the question that Bernie is raising. Yeah. Hmm? Exactly that question. Um, what is a revolution? Which is another way of saying, who do you shoot? Um, and the, the answer to that is a hard one to come by uh, in our contemporary uh, civilization. I don't think it's, uh, it's easy at all. On the other hand, one of the um, ways of dividing the 1% um, uh, from the 99% that be has become a, a paradigm is to make the argument, not that you've got to shoot them, but you have to reduce them. You have to reduce them because in the current dispensation, um, that gives them too much power over us. And, and that's the that's problem. So that, I think, is true in any revolutionary situation, who do, you, who do you go after? Who do you really have to change? And I don't think that there are easy solutions to, to, to that. Um, even though the imperative um, is there. Let, let me add to that one thing. When you read Jack London, one of the things you have to, uh, you, you will see very quickly, um, is the rage that he evokes. And that 
rage, the rage against those who have power. That rage is loose in the country at this moment. Now, where it's directed is another question. How it's directed is another question. That certainly is true in London uh, as well. Um, but any revolutionary situation involves, involves rage. Um, and um, you cannot calculate very easily how far that rage will take you and in what direction. But there it is. Listen. I was, part of your talk put me in mind of the essay, I think it was just last Sunday, in New York Times Magazine about girls in India coming from rural villages yeah. to the cities to work in textile mills. It reminded me of life in the iron mills. Um, and the interesting thing about that article was that the overall tenor of it, including the photographs that accompanied it, was one of joy, yes. one of opportunity and joy. And there were, I always read the comments, you know, just to see, and, and there were a few people sort of saying, um, should, you know, should we actually be, be celebrating um, what, you know, are being able to buy cheap clothes, where, where that comes from, but, but it reminds me of what the, the allusion you made to the issue of domestic work as opposed to uh, working for wages. I mean, essentially that's, you know, the, this is what those girls who remain in those jobs, which is I think only about 50% of them, mm -hmm. the others do go back to the village and are married off and, and so forth, um, are electing uh, working for wages versus working as basically domestic domestic help. And the difference seems to be uh, the wages themselves and the possibility of unadulterated time, however little it may be. Um, and I just wondered if you, if you read that essay or if you could comment on that in, in this yeah. regard, because it seems to me that it's similar to what we saw and what was written about in Life in the Iron Mills in the 19th century in this country, uh, mm -hmm. uh, women going from rural servitude into the cities and taking on wage labor. Well, yeah. Uh, after all, the, the primary workforce in New England, um, in the cotton mills uh, and elsewhere, uh, were r rural women. And um, when you uh, read their writing, it's, it's quite fascinating. Quite fascinating. Um, I would add to your description, though, of them, yes, um, the, the margin in life that they gain from 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 wages and the freedom in a certain sense that they have but also the pictures were very striking about the um, embrace of one another I think it, in some ways it was the most striking thing about the article um, was the sense of unity uh, that was projected by the pictures. Now, to what extent that's actually true, I'm not sure. But I, I had thought about the possibility, and then it was too long, of uh, including a couple of um, uh, stories by Fanny Fern. Fanny Fern is the middle 19th century journalist and writer um, who's really quite interesting. She began t to use the name, which had been her nom de plume, um, uh, as her own name. Uh, she writes about the situation of, occasionally, of working women. And there's one wonderful um, passage in the, um, uh, a little essay called The Working Girls of New York, in which what she's trying to do is get her readership, which are middle class women, um, to sympathize with and feel at, feel at one with the, um, with the working girls of New York who are being harassed by bosses who are male in a way similar to the way in which middle class women were, would be harassed by husbands, uh, 
brothers, as in her, her case, both by husband and brother. Uh, and she's trying to construct, even though a little incoherently, but nevertheless it's there, a kind of unity, a solidarity, if you will, between the, the readers, middle class women, white women on the whole, and the working girls. Um, and that's very, it's very different in, in my reading, at least, of, of uh, early 19th century uh, American uh, essays and, and fiction. It, it's an interesting difference. That doesn't really occur in Life in the Iron Mills. Um, in fact, the central figure is very isolated, and isolated in a variety of ways, including by being looked at by a lot of the, the guys as gender, as, as female in, in, in gender. Although, at the beginning, there is some indication that the, that the women bond. It's an interesting part of the beginning there that I've never seen anybody actually explore and why it comes out that, that, that way. They invite the, um, the central figures. Um, what is she to him exactly? I can't remember. Hmm? In, in Life in the Island? Yeah. Uh, cousin. Yeah, I think cousin, distant cousin, something like that. They invite her to come with them to, to um, wherever they're going, a bar or a drink or. But, but there's, a, there's a dimension to it that's really quite different from what he faces, which is isolation. Isolation with his art, the, 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 the carving of, um, uh, from coral, the, the leftover product of, uh, of making iron, um, carving this, this, this female figure. Um, the making of art in, this, in that story, in a way, isolates him from the, uh, uh, the possibilities of, of uh, substantial solidarity. Mm. More questions? We have time for one more. Yeah. When does work like stop being work? If you have someone who's a like a musician and they're getting paid, and then you have someone who's just plays music because they like to do it, is the fact that the first musician is getting paid, does that make it work? And then like on top of that, when is it when do you decide like, oh this work is bad, like when it gets hard? Because that seems like an inherently selfish mindset. Yeah. No, that's a wonderful question actually. That is uh, and it's one <laughs> I've struggled with myself personally <laughs> for years. It's funny for me to be talking about why work given the fact that here I am, as David said, in my middle 80s, I'm still working, right? Uh, isn't it about time to uh, lay the thing down? Um, I don't think it has to do with the hardness of it. Um, I think it has to do with the extent to which work is the central definer of our being as individuals and of the, of the nature of the society. When, when, when you feel that you are meaningless unless you work and produce, that's where the problem lies. That's where the problem lies. Not in doing the work, uh, and sometimes quite hard, and then sometimes not, not so hard. Um, it's not that. It's when you feel that if I don't, if I can't um, do the work, then I, I don't, I don't have any meaning. I'm working my ass off right now on this memoir. I was telling, telling Lucy before. I finally come to understand and respect in ways I hadn't before what that involves. You thought I was just playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, simple. <laughs> but I, I gotta, I gotta say that it's, it's, it's not because. I want to make myself worthy, but I'm enjoying it. I'm learning at age 84. I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning a new skill, and it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful skill, and I'm just loving it. And that, it seems to me, is what's critical.
that's what Bob Black is talking about when he when he talks about the joy, the pleasure. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone.